It lay in darkness at the bottom of the world, in stillness, a vast unknown, like an afterthought of creation, an undigested leftover from the last ice age that might slide off planet Earth and disintegrate in space. Now the long night has ceased. Endless summer light is shed from the polar sun. Out of the night shone knowledge, vital knowledge, reaching into the life of every one of Earth's inhabitants, reaching further still into the lives of future generations, this precious light. Yet this continent, fifth largest on our planet, would still be lost in a windy darkness were it not for a few dream-driven human beings who risked their lives and sometimes gave their lives who turn night into light. Antarctica, what is this realm of shimmering ice? To have driven discoverers against such terrible odds. Unlike the Arctic, the North Pole, Antarctica is a vast continent. There, on the globe's underside, it is surrounded by South America, Africa, and Australia. Once this continent was part of a supercontinent joined to Africa, India, South America, and Australia. The supercontinent broke up, and Antarctica drifted far south. This continent is more than chaotic ice in a blinding whiteness. There are mountains here, a range spanning 1,400 miles. There's a vast dry valley where neither rain nor snow have fallen for two million years. There is plant life here, simple lichens, mosses, algae, and two flowering plants and mites that survive in these unbelievably harsh winters. But Antarctica was not always a frozen desert. Fossils have been uncovered. Today, the Antarctic region is cushioned by pack ice and fringed by a bleakness of islands, the coastals, the subantarctics, the maritimes. The Falklands belong to the isothermal group. For almost 2,000 years, Antarctica was an unknown. No human being had even set eyes upon this continent until 1821. But explorers persisted. The 20th century saw a thawing of the continent's frozen secrets. And explorers of nations great and small, greedy to be first, drove themselves to find the very core of this continent, the South Pole. A drive exists in each of us the need to see what's on the other side of the next hill, to discover what's beyond the next mountain. Great discoveries can be mind-boggling. They can alter the course of human history, often for the better. The discovery of America was like an earthquake, shattering comfortable old concepts of the world. Its aftershock shook the foundations of human society. To us, and to our children, the discovery of Antarctica and its exploration could prove to be as momentous. To those who dwell north of the equator, Antarctica is the bottom of the world, ice fastened to the curve of the earth like a white mushroom cap, an appendage. The barren tip of South America is as close to a neighboring continent as it gets. As far back as ancient Greece, scholars surmised that there was an Antarctica. But to most people, it was an unknown. And if it wasn't, they didn't want to think about it. When we think of Antarctica, we often think of its polar opposite, the Arctic, a land of Inuit and igloos and the hot breath of a husky team. But that isn't the southern polar continent. Not even polar bears could survive these frigid temperatures. 
And as far as we know, this has never been home to any native people. It's just too cold. Explorers had been drawn to lands with people. Encountering strange and exotic cultures. Perhaps they sensed that the South Pole supported no populations. So for centuries, the Braves stayed away until the 19th and the 20th. Then there was a race to get there. Two men of incredible courage led expeditions speeding to the prize point of the pole, dead center. A continent was their stadium, and it was a race. The prestige of two sovereign nations was at stake, Amundsen, Scott. As with all fierce contests, they courted tragedy, and it came. Yet those contenders knew less about the forgotten continent than we know today. Winter darkness comes in April and lasts until August, but the rest of the year is one long day of polar summer. Then Antarctica is sunnier than Florida. It abounds in contradictions. It's as dry as the Sahara, yet it holds more fresh water than all of North America's Great Lakes combined. It's as barren as the Gobi Desert or the Russian steppes and as empty, but with beaches as crowded as any in Southern California. It's big, as big as the United States and Central America put together, roughly five and a half million miles of snow, ice, mountains, and glaciers. It's far from lifeless. Its frigid seas boil with life. Antarctica's bane and beauty both is its eternal whiteness. With snow reflecting most of the warmth away from the land, temperatures rarely reach above freezing, even in summer months. And in winter, when darkness reigns and the wind shows no mercy, they can plummet to 80 degrees below zero, or even lower. Even the ocean waters, which normally would absorb and trap the heat, as they do in the Arctic, cannot do so here because there is so much sea ice. In fact, Antarctica boasts the coldest temperature in the world. 129 degrees below was recorded in July of 1983. In these temperatures, a fish taken from water would freeze solid in just five seconds. If dropped to the ground, a steel bar would shatter. Yet during midsummer, the sun shines more here than on any given day in the Sahara. What is it then that brings the adventurers, explorers, scientists to this great foreboding landmass at the Earth's underside? The pristine beauty of an iceberg jutting out of some of the cleanest water in the world? The deep, graceful dive of a humpback whale? More likely, it's that continuing quest for knowledge which has given rise to shelters for scientists scattered across the continent. Scientists asking questions, the answers to which we're just beginning to understand. How does Antarctica affect the world's weather? Climates, food supplies, ecosystems. Back in 1911, it was something less than science that drove Roald Amundsen to the South Pole at the very same time, days, hours, minutes that Robert Falcon Scott was pushing as hard as he could to get there. Pride motivated them, and simply the need to be first. It must be remembered that, until the 19th century, no human being had ever set eyes on the continent of Antarctica. But people knew it was there. The ancient Greeks knew. Even though they were half a world away, they were the first to theorize Antarctica's existence. Greek astronomers called the North Star Polaris. They named the northernmost constellation the Bear, Arctos in Greek. From Polaris, we get the word Pole, one north and the other south. From the Bear in Arctos, we get the word Arctic, and its opposite, the Antarctic. This is how the world looked to them some three centuries BC. The landmass of the far north had to be balanced by a landmass in the extreme south. But the taut speculations of astronomers and geographers sagged under an outpour of superstition. Bottom of the world, the ancients quailed. No mariner would sail into those seas of fire, fraught with man-eating monsters. 
and whirlpools sucking ships to the depths of Hades. Throughout the ages, the notion of Antarctica intrigued the adventurous, but no hero arose to undertake such an odyssey. So the southernmost continent remained for thousands of years terra incognita, the unknown land, forbidding, and finally, forgotten. Even on our modern maps, Antarctica looks forbidding, isolated, an outsider among continents, a remnant of the last ice age. Just reaching it is agonizing. The closest reach is the tip of South America, some 700 miles across one of the most perilous waterways in the world. This is the Antarctic Peninsula. Since it extends 700 miles north, its climate is slightly milder than that of the pole. Today, it's this peninsula that's the focus of Antarctic activity. You can see that the entire continent lies inside the Antarctic Circle. A massive belt of impenetrable ice girds the continent, and during winter months extends a thousand miles out to sea. Then Antarctica nearly doubles in size, equaling that of North America, Greenland, Iceland, both Eastern and Western Europe, and even part of the Middle East. Here, the turbulent Atlantic meets the vast Pacific and the Indian Ocean as well, and they merge, helping to create one of the fiercest, most tempestuous wind tunnels in the world. The force of gravity pushes cold air down the continent's long winding slopes. 40 mile an hour winds are average. Some gust up to 200 miles an hour. This satellite picture shows how the Earth's rotation creates spiraling cyclones, which make Antarctica the windiest place on Earth. No spinner of tales, no storyteller of a thousand and one nightmares could conjure monsters so merciless as the punishing winds that lash at the Antarctic explorer. Scott knew this, and so did Amundsen, yet they persisted. Yet behind the killing gales and the bleak curtains of frost, there is life here, life in abundance. Surrounding the continent, the waters of the frigid Southern Ocean are merged with the warmer waters of the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. This is called the Antarctic Convergence. Swept in by colder currents, water rich in food rises to the surface, bringing to life thousands of miles of otherwise barren coastline. Indeed, life flourishes in the region fringing the polar continent, the sub-Antarctic. 200 species of fish, 43 different species of birds, seven kinds of seals, about 10 kinds of penguins, and whales. Many creatures, mammals, birds, depend on a single food source, krill. Krill is a Norwegian word for tiny fish. They're probably the greatest single source of protein in the world. Actually, krill are shrimp-like crustaceans, about two inches long. They exist in the hundreds of millions, spreading out in huge red masses in the coastal waters of Antarctica. For today's explorers, as for Scott and Amundsen, Antarctica is the ultimate test of survival. But there are rewards. And there are the sights, the beauties, the wonders of Antarctica. A golden sunrise after six months of winter night. Antarctica's southern lights, aurora australis, darting across the sky. Lazy seals soaking up the sun. A penguin rookery as noisy and congested as midtown Manhattan. Penguins delight us on a visit to the zoo. Here is home for them. Proliferating populations of penguins. Oh, they're the familiar chaplain-like characters in black coats and starchy white fronts. But here, there are no free fish. Life is a struggle to survive.
There are 17 species here, each as unique as the environment to which it is adapted. The Gentoo penguins, the macaroni penguins, the chinstrap penguins, The majestic emperor penguin is known for its stately demeanor and elegant gold band. It's often called the most Antarctic of them all. Emperors breed in winter. For two months, it's the males who, without rest or food, incubate the eggs and cuddle them between webbed feet. Then there are the comics, the frolics and medales. Adult penguins have only two enemies, the leopard seal, and the killer whale. Both hunt in water. These creatures show little fear of people. Even outside of a zoo, penguins are funny. They're birds, but they can't fly. So on land, they must walk. But they're clumsy walkers because they're so nearsighted. Ah, their best method of getting about is on their bellies, tobogganing. In the water, it's a different story. They're superb swimmers and agile divers. During the brief summer, penguin chicks must grow up fast. That means huge amounts of food. Hard work for parents. To penguins, the screech of the school bird is terrifying. It's the predator most feared. And even courageous parents can't always protect their chicks. Six weeks after hatching, some deep instinctive voice calls them to the sea. Now they'll practice being on their own. They must hurry to become adults. Winter is on the way, and they must grow to survive it. These waddling, near-sighted birds, so easy to parody, have seen explorers come and go. Comic as they may be, the penguins have survived them all. During the Renaissance, restless minds turned again to the continent at the South Pole. This time, it was envisioned as a land of precious woods, elephants, and gold. That famous sea dog, Sir Francis Drake, was the first Antarctic explorer, though he never came close to reaching the continent. In 1577, he sailed as far south as the stormy waters would let him. He got a bitter taste of the Drake Passage, named in his honor. Beyond the tip of Cape Horn were 100-foot waves and the most violent winds a ship had ever met, the most mad seas. But by sailing farther south than any before him, he made a curious discovery when he sighted odd flightless birds. They were evidence that farther south than anyone could have imagined, there might exist a mysterious land. Spaniards, the great explorers of the era, were too busy looting Indian empires in the Americas to take up where Drake left off and it took two more centuries for England to spawn an explorer of Drake's daring. His name, James Cook. Cook was a commoner, born on a Yorkshire farm, and as a boy apprenticed to a village shopkeeper. But he was too bright, too ambitious. He became a superb seaman, which drew the attention of higher-ups. After the Lords of the Admiralty gave him command of the HMS Endeavour, he became known to his contemporaries and to posterity as Captain Cook, the world's most renowned explorer of the Pacific. He discovered Australia, New Zealand, and claimed them both for England. He voyaged to Tahiti, to Easter Island. On his last voyage, he discovered the group of islands that are now called Hawaii, but Cook had christened them the Sandwich Islands in honor of the Lord of Sandwich. Cook met his end on the Big Island. The Polynesian king there mistook him for a god. Cook demonstrated that he wasn't. They killed him. 
Earlier in his career, in a round-the-world voyage from 1772 to 75, Captain Cook kept a journal which he titled, A Voyage Toward the South Pole. He and his crew were at sea for 36 months. That's three years. Battling storms, scurvy, fever, and sheer tedium. But he was the first to penetrate the unknown waters of the Antarctic Circle. Cook, like other early explorers, could have mistaken the dozens of islands fringing Antarctica's coastline for the continent itself. Today, geographers group these islands into four categories. The Antarctic coastals are one, like Bleak Ross Island. Similar to Antarctica, these islands are entombed in pack ice year-round. They've been described as the dreariest places the eye has ever seen. South Orkney, South Shetland, names of Scottish origin, are part of the Antarctic Maritime Group, which includes volcanic islands with steamy beaches warm enough for swimming, and cindery lava coloring an already solemn landscape with sullen grays. The subantarctics are islands such as McDonald, Heard, and South Georgia, gateway to the Antarctic. Of all the islands, they're the most mountainous, and because they're free of pack ice, they enjoy slightly warmer temperatures, although one wouldn't exactly call them balmy. For birds, their tall, swaying tussock grasses are favored sites for nesting, and for seals, lounging. Finally, the cold but temperate isothermals, the Aucklands and Antipodes by New Zealand, the Falklands by Argentina. These islands get very little, if any, snow. Here, umbrellas and Wellington boots are more in order than dog sleds. The two largest of the 200 Falklands are home to a small but hardy group of people. Most are sheep farmers, producing some of the finest wool in the world. Stanley, the quaint Victorian capital that Falklanders are so proud of. In 1982, a territorial war broke out between Britain and Argentina. Fortunately for Falklanders, it was a short war, but intense. Casualties were mourned on both sides. Though only a few hundred miles from the Antarctic Peninsula, those miles make a great difference. The climate is temperate. For the patient scientist, these islands are like terrariums, oceanariums, an albatross whose magnificent wingspan casts shadows on jagged cliffs. One discovers valley lowlands lush with vegetation, forbidding cliffs, sandy beaches, and sea kelp hugging the shore. On his historic voyage, Captain Cook got as far as the thick ice belt girding Antarctica. He knew that there was land beyond that ice because South Georgia, one of the several islands he discovered, was also belted with ice. Rather than risk being landlocked or even shipwrecked, he headed home, convinced that whatever land was guarded by that massive ice belt would be of no use to the world. Hero that he was, he was wrong. Accounts of Cook's voyage reached the adventurous and the unscrupulous. By the end of the 18th century, the northern fur seal was getting scarcer. Now came news of abundant seal populations near the South Pole. There are several kinds of seals native to the Antarctic region. The elephant seal, which can weigh up to four tons, the leopard seal, the crab eater, now the most abundant in the world, the Ross, and the remarkable Weddells, who can dive deeper and stay under longer than any other mammal. Their fur is soft, thick, and beautiful, a superb insulator against the water's cold and the frigid winds above the water. But that fur almost brought about their extinction. Now greed fueled exploration. Running out of quarry up north, Seal hunters pressed south, seeking new rookeries. 
they were ruthless. Around 1820, although they weren't looking for it, it was sealers who first set eyes on the Antarctic continent itself. But they didn't talk much about it. They wanted no competition for these treasure troves, so they kept quiet. In 30 years, they slaughtered more than three and a half million Antarctic seals to within a hair's breadth of extinction. For pelts, for oil for the burgeoning industries back home. The official sighting of the Antarctic continent was made in 1821 by Thaddeus Bellingshausen, a Russian admiral, after most of the sealers had come and gone. The important thing is that someone had actually seen it. It had been difficult, indeed, to interest nations in exploring a place no human being had seen. A theory, a myth, maybe. Now we knew that it was there, officially. An immense, fearsomely beautiful mantle of white. Brave ones began hearing the call. Three nations sponsored separate expeditions, but with one aim, scientific knowledge. Search out the magnetic South Pole. Not only did these three expeditions fail to find the pole, they never reached shore. France's Captain Dumont d'Urville did discover a species of penguin which he named Adélie after his wife. Captain Charles Wilkes of the USA had naturalists on board whose artistic renderings of Antarctica's splendor are the first and some of the finest the world has ever seen. James Clark Ross of England did break through the pack ice, a maze of ice that, with one wrong maneuver, could rip open the hull of a wooden ship. Ross is hardly forgotten. Today, Antarctica has a Ross Island, a Ross Sea, and a Ross ice shelf, a massive ice plate the size of France. Ross was first to discover Mount Erebus, named after his ship, the region's only active volcano. 19th century technology was taming Mother Earth and unlocking her secrets. The source of the Nile was established. The Suez Canal was opened. Henry Morton Stanley descended the Congo River in search of the lost explorer, Dr. David Livingston. He found him. Explorer Fridtjof Nansen drifts across the Arctic and American naval officer Robert Edwin Perry discovers the North Pole. The heroic age had begun. The glory seekers had shied away from Antarctica, but now the world was running out of opportunities. The South Pole was the last unknown. Suddenly, it seemed that everyone heard the call. Nations sent their bravest and their best. Norway, Sweden, Germany, France, Japan, and Great Britain. Britannia's namesakes in Antarctica outnumbered those of any other nation. At the beginning of the 20th century, she was the matron of the earth, with a lion's appetite for heroes to fatten her prestige. The British Empire reached into every continent, Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, North and South America, but one. Antarctica. Someone had yet to reach the South Pole. That someone had to be British. Disciplined, hardworking, and ambitious, Robert Falcon Scott seemed the perfect candidate. A lieutenant in the Royal Navy, he was only 32 when he applied for the prestigious position of captain with the British Antarctic Expedition. He got it. He sailed on the 6th of August, 1901, on a small wooden ship named Discovery. It was already a hero's send-off. Science was the reason for this voyage, and Scott's experience at sea would safely transport a team of experts. Now, we might ask, was a man trained for the sea the best choice for land exploration? Morale was high. There were sweets on Saturdays, birthdays, holidays. Sometimes a gramophone was wound up, old favorites played again and again. Scientists wasted no time in setting up research. 
studies in magnetism, oceanography, geology, meteorology, and biology. Scott got the first bird's eye view of the place from a gas balloon. It was on this trip that Scott made his first bid for the South Pole, coming within 440 miles of it. Scott and his men experienced firsthand the dangers of the place, scurvy, frostbite, and a horrible snow blindness. Worse, a man was lost, plummeting over a precipice into an icy deep that silenced him forever. Even Scott, an eternal optimist, was moved to write, Wherever my destiny may in the future lead me, I hope it will not again be to the interior of the Antarctic continent. Seven years later, he was back. Today, Scott's vessel, the Discovery, is refurbished and docked in Dundee, Scotland, inviting people to marvel that so small a ship once played so large a role. It was the beginning of the 20th century. Bertie, as they called Edward VII, King of Great Britain and Ireland and Emperor of India, was on good terms with his cousin Willy, Kaiser Wilhelm, Emperor of Germany. A few years later, their nation's armies would be fighting each other from the trenches of World War I. In 1911, the RMS Titanic was being readied for its maiden voyage. A shipbuilder boasted, Only God can sink this ship. He did. 1911 was a year when people flocked to see that newfangled form of entertainment, the Flickers. But the flicks weren't only a pastime. The day-by-day -day progress of Captain Scott's second British Antarctic expedition was recorded on motion picture film. Now a more seasoned explorer, Scott carefully planned his polar assault. 19 Manchurian ponies and steel tractors to lay down supply depots. He'd worked it all out. With an arrogance bred by the Empire, Scott proclaimed, the pole must be discovered by an Englishman. There were others who felt differently. Scott's contender was from a small country, only recently independent and hardly a player in the world's power games, Norway. Raw-boned, hawk-nosed Roald Amundsen was from a land of fjords and heavy snows, whose northern reaches extended into Lapland to a people finely tuned to the rhythms of nature, of the earth, a slim longboat of a nation reaching into the frozen Arctic. Amundsen was close to nature, and his wants were simple. He had wanted to be the first to reach the North Pole, but the American Robert E. Perry had beaten him to it. So Amundsen fixed his hawk-like gaze on the South Pole for Norway. He had trained as an explorer in the Arctic, endured the rigors of polar exploration, learned tough survival skills from the Inuit, Eskimos. He grasped the importance of dog teams and learned how to handle them. Now it was 1911, and Amundsen felt that he'd spent his whole life preparing for this moment. The English have loudly and openly told the world that skis and dogs are unusable in these regions and that fur clothes are rubbish. We will see. If a dog falls into a crevice, it is quickly out. But a pony... Scott's men spent the long winter months setting up a base at Cape Evans. Here, Scott puts his elaborate plans to reach the pole into effect. He put his tractors to setting up supply depots along the route, welcome oases for later use. His ponies were set to pulling sledges for the first laps to the pole. Since no one knew how to use the dogs, Scott left them behind. 
The men could haul the sledges on the final lap. 1911. It was a contest, a race to the pole. But Scott didn't know it yet. Amundsen had never publicly revealed his plans, even to his own crew. In learning that he had a rival in Amundsen, Scott was stunned. On the 1st of November, 1911, Captain Robert Falcon Scott set out with several support parties, tractors, supplies, and 19 Manchurian ponies to stake the South Pole with a flag of Great Britain. Each explorer had no way of knowing when the other was setting out. Roald Amundsen had set out two weeks earlier with four determined companions and 54 team dogs. They progressed on a give and take between the survival skills of the Norwegians and the survival instincts of the dogs. It was harsh, but simple. If a dog weakened, he became food for the men as well as for the animals. Scott's well-laid plans went afoul. The tractors broke down, inoperable in the extreme cold. The snow was too soft and too deep for the Manchurian ponies, so reluctantly, one by one, they were shot. Then, at the last minute, Scott asked a fifth man to join the small team that would make the final trek to the pole, a decision he later regretted when food and fuel were running out. Now Scott's men had to harness themselves to the sledges and pull them as beasts of burden. In his journal, Scott wrote, Reaching the pole on foot would make the conquest more nobly and splendidly done. In movie houses, this remarkable footage was seen by millions. But these brave men you're watching didn't live to see themselves on film. Each night without dusk, the tent was raised. A small oil stove gave enough heat for cooking and for thawing frozen fingers and toes. They rationed themselves 34 ounces a day of beef stew, butter, sugar, cocoa, rock-hard biscuits, and tea. Scott must have sensed that the odds were stacking up against him. The cold was colder than he'd remembered. The winds fiercer. Supplies were dangerously low. The 200-pound loads that each man dragged were becoming unbearable. Perhaps Scott's own words were driving them on. The pole must be discovered by an Englishman. Because they persisted over some of the continent's most tedious and treacherous terrain. On 16 January 1912, they arrived at a point that their compasses told them was the South Pole. It had been staked with a Norwegian flag. Roald Amundsen had made the discovery on 14 December 1911, 32 days before them. It was a bitter disappointment. And I'm very sorry for my loyal companions. There was nothing for them to do now other than turn around and struggle back to a supply depot. With food and fuel dwindling through the rest of January into February, then March, they trudged more and more weakly like dying beasts over the frozen wastes. By mid-March, two of Scott's men had perished. I do not regret this journey, which has shown that Englishmen can meet death with as great a fortitude as ever in the past. Imprisoned by a blinding storm, without food or fuel, the others succumbed leaving Scott to die alone. What is it like to die in such a place? Hearing only the bitter wind, seeing only the puffs of your own frozen breath getting smaller and smaller. 
They say that you cease to feel the cold when dying of it. The blood congeals. There's a humming, and you become very sleepy. Your eyelids close for the last time. And you're warm again. For God's sake, look after our people. They didn't know it, but there was food and fuel to be had at a supply depot just 10 miles away. England had got her heroes. Eight months passed before a rescue party discovered the death tent. The men were found as they had died. Scott's journal was beside him. The tent was collapsed and a stone cairn built over it. With a quote from scripture. The Lord giveth. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In Antarctica, it followed a predictable pattern, responding to some base human instinct. Heroic exploration was fast followed by far from heroic exploitation. Whalers plundered the Antarctic just as the sealers had. It seemed nothing could stop them. At one time, the whale population here outnumbered all others in the world by four to one. But sheer numbers were no match for the hunt that was on. Hand harpoons were replaced by powered harpoons. Between 1880, when oil, candles, cosmetics, margarine, animal feeds, and fertilizer were whale byproducts, and 1940, Antarctic whales were hunted down to a fraction of their former population. With high-powered harpooning, the killing was as efficient as the butchering and processing on board the floating factory ships. Today, heaps of whale bones bleaching in the polar sun, but brittle from the cold, are a kind of eerie memorial. Robert Falcon Scott was hardly forgotten, and Britannia still hungered for glory at the pole. Another Englishman came forward to revive British efforts in Antarctica. Tall, broad-shouldered Ernest Shackleton, who'd been with Scott on Scott's first expedition. Now the leader of his own British expedition, Shackleton aimed to make the first trans-Antarctic crossing. In January of 1915, his ship, aptly named the Endurance, was penetrating the pack ice when it became riveted, frozen in. They tried to free it, but it was slowly being crushed the crew transferred stores to an ice floe, together with the ship's three boats. Millions of tons of ice cracked its beams like toothpicks. As they slogged 500 miles over pack ice, searching for land, they drifted on floes to Bleak Elephant Island in the South Shetlands. Shackleton determined, we've got to reach a point where we can get a ship. He asked for volunteers. Staggeringly, they sailed 800 miles in a lifeboat. These seas are deadly for sturdy ships, much less fragile little boats. 
Yet they reached South Georgia Island. It was the 10th of May, 1916. They returned and rescued the crew they'd left behind. On the whole expedition, not a single man was lost. And Ernest Shackleton was awarded a hero's welcome home. His accomplishments were summed up by a fellow explorer. The scientific leadership give me Scott. For swift and efficient travel, Amundsen. But when you're in a hopeless position, when there seems no way out, get down on your knees and pray for Shackleton. In less than 20 years, there were more than a dozen expeditions from eight different nations, each adding its own chapter to polar exploration. Leading the way was the airplane. Of the nations tumbling over each other to be first in this or that in Antarctica, the USA was lagging behind. Emerging victorious from World War I, America plunged into the 1920s like an energetic adolescent full of sass and daring. Flexing her muscle, sowing her wild oats. But she needed to show the world that she could come up with her share of heroes, like Lindbergh and Richard Byrd. Richard E. Byrd was a product of Annapolis. As a midshipman, he seriously injured his leg at gymnastics. Yet he graduated, and they sent him to sea. But the leg he'd injured wasn't strong enough for him to carry out his duties, and tactfully, he was retired. He was a young man, full of fight, and he wasn't about to be turned out to pasture. He stood up to the Navy, arguing that he could learn to fly an airplane. You don't fly with your feet? He was trained as a Navy pilot. In 10 years, he was his nation's flag bearer in a race to the North Pole. His opponent was an old hand at racing, Roald Amundsen. Richard Byrd admired Amundsen, and the two became friends, yet they were rivals who would be first to reach the North Pole by airplane. The beetle-browed Viking? Or the brash young American's bird and his friend and co-pilot, Floyd Bennett? The Americans got there first. Gracious Amundsen, the loser, embraced them. In America, Byrd and Bennett were welcomed as national heroes. In 1928, Floyd Bennett died, a great loss to Byrd. That same year, Richard E. Byrd would head south for the first aerial exploration of Antarctica. They set sail in late 1928 on the city of New York. to make the first flight over the South Pole. 50,000 Americans volunteered to go with him. He chose 41. Bird chose a site for his base of operations. Supplies were hauled in. Shelters erected. Ice tunnels were dug, linking all of the camp buildings. Like Amundsen, Bird believed that it is not bad luck that beats you. It's poor planning. Bird's pet dog, Little Igloo, kept him company on the expedition. And the sled dog seemed right at home here. It's a community, the first in Antarctica. There was even bath night. most from civilization, he answered, temptation. Big America was 12,000 miles away, so Bird named the colony Little America. Big America, 96 above. Little America, 72 below. His solo flight over the pole will be fraught with danger. 
This was 1929. Aviation still suffered from growing pains. An air pocket, a mechanical slip, a storm could mean certain death. Bird waited for a break in the weather. On Thanksgiving Day, it came. From the cockpit, he followed the trail that Amundsen had taken. But there, the similarity ceased. His plane was loaded with equipment for aerial photography. On the ground, it would have taken Amundsen a whole year to survey what Bird could survey from the air in a single day. Directly over the pole, he dropped a small American flag, weighted with a stone from the grave of his friend and former co-pilot, Floyd Bennett. Bird made in less than 16 hours a journey that had taken Amundsen three months. When the news got out, a message came in from his mother. I knew you could do it, but oh, I'm so glad it's over. In Manhattan, for the second time around, Richard E. Bird was given a ticker tape welcome. Three years later, he was back in Antarctica, manning the continent's first inland weather station. This time, he was poisoned by carbon monoxide from a faulty generator and nearly died. On his return, he was greeted by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Richard Byrd went back to Antarctica a third, a fourth, and in 1957 for a fifth time to help fly in supplies for the newly established Amundsen-Scott scientific base. That was the year he died. We remember him as the man who put America on the map of the Antarctic continent. Astronauts have described Antarctica as radiating light like a great white lantern at the bottom of the world. It, more than any other place on Earth, stands out like a beacon. It beckons today's explorers as it has the explorers of the past. Its mantle of mountains, its dry valley, its wonders. Today, those who come here can thrill to the frolicking chorus of whales, diving, breaching. Once again, whales abound in these waters, due largely to an international treaty that prohibits hunting them. And today, hunting seals is forbidden. Rookeries thrive once more, livening hundreds of miles of shoreline. Alarmed by the killing off of the area's marine life, Britain launched research programs in the 1920s and 30s. In 1959, these efforts climaxed in the Antarctic Treaty. Nations which had raced to the pole as rivals not only paused to catch their breath, but joined hands. The treaty proposes that Antarctica be used only for purposes that are peaceful. It bans nuclear testing, and commercial exploitation. It places a moratorium on new territorial claims. It calls for cooperation in research among world scientists. Today, 34 nations have signed. Here, a giant step has been taken, a first for humankind. Antarctica is a continent-sized laboratory. Biologists, meteorologists, glaciologists, oceanographers, and seismologists finishing the work of Cook, Amundsen, Scott, and Bird in unlocking the inner workings of a strange and wondrous continent. During the six months of austral summer, these scientists of different nationalities, backgrounds, languages call Antarctica home. Today, the gear is high tech. Snowmobiles may outnumber dog teams, although dog tracks still crisscross the snow. For reliability, dogs can't be beat. With or without high tech, survival for them is the same as it was for Amundsen. 
It's a sharing of hardships along with moments of relaxation, of living and working together through the tedium of 24-hour daylight or darkness, of overcoming feelings of emptiness and the loneliness of isolation in the vast bottom of the world. From whatever race they may be or whatever culture, they look to each other. Each is defined by his field of science, not his nationality. Harmony prevails, for without harmony, they could accomplish little for the general good, a lesson for nations. And so they pool their staggering brain power and work for us. Some of the scientific probing is in the seas, how fish survive these frigid waters because of an antifreeze that occurs naturally in the blood. Or jewels of the ocean bottom, spinefish and sea urchins, starfish and squid, oversized from living in seas which abound in oxygen. Some say that krill, the first link in the Antarctic food chain, can be harvested for the world's hungry or that icebergs should be melted to provide water for the arid countries like Australia. Some propose mining and drilling here for minerals, for petroleum. Others are opposed to it. They've discovered that the Southern Ocean's icy currents helped create the Namib Desert on the southwestern coast of Africa, 3,000 miles away. They've learned that there's a hole in the ozone layer, that protective umbrella for all living things, directly above the continent. This is the only ecosystem on Earth that's still largely untouched by humans. It holds valuable clues to the world's weather systems, hence to our future. Were the polar ice cap to break up and melt, a result of the greenhouse effect, Melting glacial waters would cause the world's oceans to rise and flood every coastal city out of existence. New York, Sydney, Liverpool, Acapulco, and Alexandria. Much farmland would go underwater. The icy currents of these waters could force world temperatures to all-time lows and usher in the next ice age. If that happened, even tropical forests would become frigid, more like Arctic tundra than jungle. Will these possibilities come about? Scientists here, the new explorers, are probing for answers. In recent years, one of those who approached with awe and dread this snow-white continent was Peter Scott, whose father, Captain Robert Scott, perished here, a kind of martyr to South Polar exploration. We can only guess what the younger Scott felt when encountering vestiges of his father's ill-fated expedition. Certainly sadness, mixed with feelings of pride, and perhaps a closeness not only to his father, but to all explorers who've risked their lives to unlock the secrets of Antarctica. The Great White Lantern continues to beckon, a place of sheer wonder whose mysteries we are only beginning